Hello, I'm your host, Effie Pilarinu, and today I have the pleasure to have with us uh, Olaf uh, Ransom. Welcome, Olaf. Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for having me. It's, it's a great pleasure. So Olaf is uh, also a Salman Brothers veteran, um, and I would say that, you know, he's right at the spot that I think is really where the innovation is going to happen, which is at the infrastructure level. We have seen a lot of innovation in financial services, first at the user uh, level. You know, there are people out there that um, have innovated uh, and continue to innovate at the user experience level. And um, now I think is the time that we are going to see substantial innovation at the infrastructure level. And in some countries that is already happening. But I say all this because Olaf is really, he calls himself the, what, the banker's plumber? The banker's plumber, that's right. It was a nickname that somebody gave to me, as best I can recall, at a Cybos event. Two, yeah, 2000, I think it was in San Francisco. Somebody's comment over in is, are you just the banker's plumber? And it kind of stuck and got used and turned out to be helpful uh, in, in all the things that I do. So yeah, I I get to do all the, the post-trade stuff after somebody says buy and sell. Um, and yes, in my earliest days at Salomon, all those post-trade things were extremely manual. Uh, and extremely complex. Although actually one of the challenges from that earliest day uh, stays in all these comments about infrastructure. When I joined Salomon's in 87, uh, just before your time, but, but still early enough to settle Michael Lewis's trade before he started to write books for a living, um, the firm was highly leveraged. It was leveraged about 40 to one. And one early lesson uh, that sticks with me to this day is how important liquidity is. So if you were at Salomon's at the time, Salomon's was well known to be king of the bond markets. It was, and they would buy tons of government bonds. They didn't have an enormous amount of capital and you had to be very precise about making sure that the right amount of money was in the right place at the right time. And you know, for all that, you might now look back at that era and go, gosh, that wasn't very sophisticated. And gosh, some of those things we did were manual. One thing we did bonds, is, uh, remind us how bonds traded at the time and what the settlement was. Well, so I had the delights on my entrance to settlement of, of helping to settle French government bonds. I will add that it was so long ago that many of those bonds have since matured and they were in French francs. <laughs> and there were 26 different ways to calculate the price of a French government bond, so much so that the traders gave us presents of HP12C calculators, and you'll remember the HP12C from uh, days on the floor at Salmons, and some of them would settle monthly, some of them would settle weekly, um, all kinds of processes when you look now, you look, How was gosh, that? This, was, this was so delayed, but nonetheless, at some point, all these trades piled up and there was a requirement to settle transactions. You know, and if you're Solomon Brothers, your balance sheet was in dollars and you were buying things in French francs. That, for many of our listeners, was a predecessor to the euro, uh, like the Deutsche Mark. And you had to have all these things. And it was, it was really quite complicated. But because the firm was so leveraged, there was an enormous uh, emphasis on this cash management thing of being really sure that you could settle the trades, you had the right money in the right time. And, you know, gosh, if you were in a situation where you should have delivered somebody bonds and got French francs in return, and that went wrong, um, in spite of the, the very manual processes and the crude processes, as we would look back, there was an enormous scrutiny on, you know, how did you not get this piece of inventory out the door and get cash? You know, why did we have less cash? Because you messed up. And implicitly, the assumption was that you messed up to begin with. And we can philosophize about that. But a huge emphasis on, on, on liquidity. And, and though those lessons uh, have stuck with me, uh, whilst the world has become rather more complicated in the interim. You've been involved also in all the emerging technologies that um, um, aspire to 
replace this infrastructure. And of course, I'm referring yeah. to, to blockchain or distributed ledgers. You have um, consulted and worked with several of uh, big projects or, or big entities like Clearmatics, like Finality International, also our Swiss um, digital exchange. So, so there's lots um, to, to uh, pick your mind, your brain from all these insights. Um, and I understand also that you've been on the um, blockchain expert uh, policy uh, yep. board. Yeah, OECD at the OECD. So, so you have quite a bit of a broad um, experience and insights in all these uh, developments. So lots to talk about. Uh, let's start with liquidity, which obviously you have a lot of experience and is extremely important in the spotlight or so with what is going on uh, with the uh, U.S. banking troubles, right? Yeah. So what would you say are the, in, in your mind or to, to guide our audience, what are the top factors that determine liquidity and where do you sort of look for leaks or, or breaks in that flow uh, of, of money? Mm -hmm. So I think the top factor that determines whether it's done properly is, is interest in the function. Um, we traditionally have talked front office, back office. And I must say over the years, I've always, I've always not really liked the back office term. Sometimes you have to settle for the fact that it just gets used and it's like, okay, that's the expression that people use. I, I prefer operations, but generally, in, in certainly over the lifetime of both yours and my career, that operations back office function has been largely a poor relation for one of any better expression. Um, and interestingly, and I, I always use this quote and I, I, I will do, um, Ron Ram, who's the CEO of Finality International and took me into USC and, and we started getting into this, this digital asset thing. He used to be a trader at um, Deutsche Bank in foreign exchange. And he's, yeah, you know, we just set the trade for, we just assumed money. Now, he greatly regrets ever saying that to me because I keep quoting it. And I mean this in the nicest way because Ron has made fantastic contribution to helping to make tomorrow's infrastructure. But there was always this assumption that you just assumed money that's in there. So I think that the biggest influence you can have on liquidity is understanding your own processes and your capabilities to fund the activity that you're in. So back to that early lesson that I quoted before at Salomon's, I'd contrast that to the lesson of our friends in the pension fund industry in the UK in October. They had a bit of a crisis. They had expanded their activities to do derivatives. And we can philosophize on derivatives, good thing, bad thing, whatever. Yep. Um, but they got margin calls. Now, there's only three ways to meet a margin call. You've got money in the bank or coming in the door because you've got depositors. You can finance your inventory through doing what you and I know well from Salomon's days of repo trades. Because if you've got a big balance sheet at Salomon's, you learn to do repo trades. Or you can sell stuff. Now, in the case of the pension funds, they couldn't do number one because there was no more money coming in. Pension funds are rather fixed. They weren't actually set up properly for number two. They might have done a little bit of repo, but they weren't, they weren't there able to do what I at least learned to do with the bonds that you guys in the trading floor would trade at Solomon's, which is to repo out every damn bit of collateral to get cash in. They weren't ready to do all of that. And I, I even heard a story that one of the custodians in London, and it will remain nameless, when push came to shove, the custodian arm that was supporting the pension funds could not connect to the securities lending desk, even though the custodian could look at the inventory and go, I know that Effie's pension fund has got all these assets. If I could give them to the guy who does repo over here, we could do cash. That went wrong. So what did they do? They had to sell and it got worse. So as we think about what's happened in the pension fund, it's a new thing, new phenomenon. We've actually got some convergence with what we need in terms of practices, which is you need to give more weight to the operational stuff that you can actually do all of these things. Now, that's one lesson, irrespective of whether we have new tech or 
no new tech. I think the the bit that we can take away from efforts like the Playmatics finality things, the Playmatics the utility settlement coin emerged to be finality is irrespective of what we think of blockchain. And it is by far and away not the only answer to every tech problem. It has had us focus on some of the not so efficient processes. And what we can see now available in the technology is that we can compose the pieces in different ways. And so but I, I suspect that financial services will evolve well and healthily and the private sector will be very creative and we'll have will compose those services in new ways that make some of that um, settlement stuff easier. But we, in doing it, some of those existing businesses, like the guys in the pension fund industry, should be very conscious that there are plenty of good tools available and discipline available to them today um, to run their businesses, you know, in a more controlled fashion um, and, and manage some of their liquidity better. Um, flip side is um, liquidity is tricky to manage because we have myriad bits of infrastructure. So you know, the, the you simple summary. Our audience all of a bit about finality and the settlement coin. Uh, because yeah. A lot of people may not be familiar. So, if you look up finality, you need to misspell it. Yes. There is no first I. It's finality without that first I. Um, and you'll see that it's a company based um, in the UK. It started as a research project, um, largely driven by five institutions. I think UBS, Bank of New York, CIBC, State Street, and what was then the CME, if I remember it rightly. That UBS were front and center with this saying, well, what happens if all the assets get tokenized and they're on chain? Mm -hmm. We need to be able to pay for things on chain. So that was just the original driver that said, if one is true, we need an answer to the second. And there was a whole bunch of research work. And I was in on the end of that research work just before it all turned into finality. Uh, and the idea was to just create a means of payment that was on chain. That was the equivalent of cash so that you could move it um, instantly and didn't rely on correspondent banks. And that's that's the genesis of the thing. I think now, if you look, the tokenization of assets hasn't happened quite as quickly as everybody would like. Um, you now get into the chicken and egg problem is the reason that we haven't got the tokenized assets because we haven't got the tokenized means of payment or not, which I'd say quite possibly yes, um, but these things haven't emerged. But now, as you look at you know, what could a finality do or something like RTGS Global, where I'm also doing some work at the moment, you say, okay, well, from a liquidity perspective, this could be a single pool of liquidity which connects to many settlement needs. So what we have today in the TradFi infrastructure is everything is rather split or fragmented. Yeah. You have security settlement in Clearstream, or as both of us are, uh, long enough in the business to have called it a Sidel back in the day as we've been around. You have bonds in Euroclair, you have bonds in domestic systems, same with equities. You may have multiple places where you have dollars and so on. So the, the cash management job, as important as it is, and liquidity management is actually very, very difficult to have in a funny in the right place at the right time. And because of that fragmentation, there's a whole bunch of rules that go with it, and the rules then require capital, which makes it all very expensive and difficult. So we're largely effective, largely. We, we settle trades, we get stuff done. Like sure, banks have hiccups, all the rest of it, but we're pretty good day-to-day -day getting these things done. But really, we're not very efficient, and there's lots of change going on in and around this. There are more demands for instant payments. There's our American friends and European friends suggesting that security settlement go to T plus one. Plus one yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's great if you're in the US and all you've got to think about is dollars. Well, if you're in the US, the chances are you're not mentally capable of thinking about more than dollars. Um, but if you're in New Zealand, you're suddenly looking at that going, well, this is a problem. So there's lots of pressure on the money part. And back to my, my quote of my, my good friend Ron from Finality, just assume money. 
that gets to be dangerous. So we 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 need to solve uh, have better solutions for, for for money and the infrastructure. And actually, the more that time goes on, the more I'm worried about um, you know, whether we've whether we've got the right. Uh, infrastructure for tomorrow infrastructure and plus then you know all the the right regulations and policies to to adapt to to that environment is the jp morgan coin um comparable to the finality settlement coin or because i don't hear anything about it since it mm. was launched and and, and it's yeah. to me that it is similar in nature but only confined within the the JP Morgan um, client um, uh, yeah. ecosystem, yeah. Uh, so, not across any other banks. Yeah. So, when it was launched, it was launched with a lot of fanfare that made it look like something that might be otherwise dubbed a stable coin or, or something close to a CBDC. And, and Jamie Diamond was slightly disingenuous, one might say. He said, yeah, but we've got a fistful of dollars of the Fed. But the truth of the matter is, if today you're holding $100 million of JP coin, as my friends at Goldman Sachs might be doing at the moment, because they settle some of their bonds that way, you're in exactly the same position as if you've got a balance of $100 million of JP. You're an unsecured creditor. That's it. And, and it doesn't matter, right, if the music stopped right now at JP, and you know, God forbid that would happen because we would have a lot greater problems, but at least, you know, for the purposes of the plumbing that I get into, if the music stopped, it doesn't matter how much money JP have got at the Fed. You're an unsecured creditor. You're an unsecured creditor. There's no problem if you, your business and my business both have accounts at JP. Whether we've got balances or JP coin, broadly, we're pretty indifferent. I think what... Probably my guess, and I'm guessing here, is that, well, I know that JP had some pretty rickety old payments infrastructure. This is not a surprise. Lots of banks have pretty rickety old payments infrastructure. And at some point, it was time to do some new infrastructure. And what I suspect is somebody at the back of the room has piped up and said, let's use blockchain. That's really sexy. The engineers are going to get really excited about that. Perfectly good answer. If using a particular technology makes your engineers excited and gets you there, great. JP needed new infrastructure in order to off improve and, and expand their product offering, all perfectly legit. Uh, and then I think they were warned at some point to sort of tone down the rhetoric about their coin because, uh, and I've said this at length, their coin is of no use outside the four walls of JP. And neither is anybody else's stable coin, and neither would tokenized deposits be. But perfectly good. Um, I'll give you an example of people who are in the repo market. So there's been developments in processing. Um, actually, Fairstream, Deutsche Börse, Fairstream, uh, cooperating with HQLAX to help collateral be traded and to do collateral versus collateral trades. Now, if you're in the bond trading business, you need to do collateral upgrade trades all day long because you buy a certain quality of bond with a conviction that you it's going to do something to your advantage, but you need to finance it, especially if you've got that Salomon mentality that, that you and I know well. But often you can't get financing for that asset. So what you do is you swap it with a trade to get treasuries for the sake of argument. And then you finance the treasuries. And there's a whole mini industry around this. HQLAX have helped that happen. They enable upgrade trades. If you're someone like Goldman Sachs, you need to do upgrade trades all day long. You use the new infrastructure, and then you go to JP. And go, hey, I've got uh, I've got some tokens representing this high quality collateral, high quality liquid asset. Will you will you give me some money? JP have set that all up on their new infrastructure, and they give Goldman Sachs some JP point. That's great. That then gets turned into dollars and wired out, and that goes into the TradFi world. And you can see those elements starting to combine. But JP are just using the coin as a convenient way for them to process transactions. Great. Uh, guys are gone totally happy. Everybody will have it. Um, but it, they're not sending JP coin to the people Goldman Sachs got to pay bills to. 
Understood. Understood. When we look at what's going on in the central bank digital currency uh, um, global experimentation <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, storm that has hit us, um, tsunami. It, the tsunami, you, you, you would say. And if we put aside that most of these um, projects, whether they're they're live or in whatever phase, they they are mostly focused on some retail design, but there are a few that are not. They are more into your plumbing uh, area, um, whether it is the Enbridge uh, project or Helvetia. Um, I think Meridian too is also in that category. What what are your thoughts about those? If you want to call them projects or pilots or uh, in concept phase <laughs> uh, experiments, uh, and and how do you think that they will get to market, or wh what are your thoughts? Um, I think a summary. <laughs> now, I give you a summary view, which is too much experimentation is a dangerous thing. Uh, and I've had this conversation actually with somebody from the BIS Innovation Hub, who shall remain nameless. And I said, look, guys, you're doing so much stuff that you're crowding out the private sector. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm old enough to have done my A-level economics in, in England um, when Mrs. Thatcher was in power. And this whole crowding out thing um, was, was a thing. It was a feature of uh, in economics discussions around the end of the 70s and 80s that if the government did too much, the private sector just took a step back. And I think one one risk we have, whatever the merits of any of these individual experiments, is that our, our central bank friends are so busy innovating here, there, and everywhere with what seem to be rather lim relatively limitless budgets that if you're the private sector, you've got to look and go, I, I, I don't know, what are they going to do? Okay. Where's the line? And, and unfortunately, regulators have a habit of being both operators of systems and regulators. So in the US, the Fed runs the Fed wire and now Fed now, and then there's chips and um, RTP, real-time payments. In Europe, our good friends up in Frankfurt um, run the Euro systems target two, and then you've got EBA the ECB regulate EBA and the Fed regulates chips. So I, for all for all the, the the technical value that the experiments show, I th at the moment my feeling is it doesn't show a clear path of what would be a good solution in a public private cooperation. And there's a risk of that, that crowding out just leading to inactivity. And in fact, I can tell you, somebody this weekend from my circle of people who asked me stuff um, from one of the South African banks sent me a note about what the ECB are up to in doing a wholesale experiment. And says, does this mean that, you know, finality is toast? And then that could be a crowding out thing where people who would support, the private sector would support that solution but the signal from the central banks and the ECB is, oh, we might do this ourselves. Who's doing what? Should I move? Yeah. Would it be a waste of my money? Um, yeah. And that that feels wrong to me. I understand what you're saying, Olaf, but I think it's also an overreaction from the central ah, bankers yes. to what our dear friend Mark Zuckerberg did to them you know, woke them up yeah. in the middle of the night and said, I'm going to do this, Libra, DM, whatever. Yes. Right? And then since then, they have lost their sleep and they're reacting to all of that. And, and it's a huge messaging that you, nobody comes close to doing anything with issuing money, what is money, nobody's going to redefine that and, and how it works. Yeah, that's an absolutely valid statement. So I think you're you're absolutely right. There was a huge OMG moment when when Zuckerberg had his plan, um, 
and then they were like, no, we're not going to do this. And you know, eventually it's like, well, we don't want to, the multi-currency fund was a hilarious idea. I just didn't know how that, you know, what were they thinking when that one came out? Um, Cause that just had currency risk written all over it. And then they went to dollars. And then of course the Swiss, I guess, must have thought, well, it's a dollar based payment system. That's not us. Because the dollars, you know, yep. we have to get cooperative oversight with uh, um, with the Americans, and there's there's a whole bunch of guidance and rules around that. So yes, I think you're right that there's a lot of reaction. One of the things that I don't see when I look around all the stuff that's being done, and I have a paper on some of this coming out shortly. I don't think that all the regulators appreciate the the vast expense which they burden the private sector with. Um, for all these liquidity buffers. So they write all these rules that go, well, you know, depending on how much credit you need an intraday credit, you therefore need to have buffers, and which in isolation are all very valid. Those things are very, very expensive. Um, and in order to get out of that trap, we need new infrastructure. Um, and it would, it, to me, it would feel better if, the public sector were saying, well, it should look roughly like this. Here's the ballpark. Now go away and do something there rather than attempting to prove that you could do things in the ballpark, which makes people shy away from um, coming to a conclusion. I, I talked a couple of minutes earlier about how alarmed I am about liquidity and something shocked me the other day. I was looking at some stats about activity. So I had the good fortune post my golden time to manage um, a project at Credit Suisse globally to join CLS, the FX settlement utility, which was introduced in 2002. And I started on that in the middle of 1999. I just looked at the stats going back to 2001. So 2001 in the FX markets, whatever was traded had to be settled with settlement risk. You and I would be on the phone. We would agree a trade back then. It would have been in Greek drachma versus pounds or Swiss francs. We would have to trust each other and I would send you some pounds and you would send me some Greek pragma and you know, broadly speaking, everything would be fine. But the numbers were pretty big and the industry had been um, browbeaten would be the right word into coming up with this CLS solution, continuous link settlements. The volume back in 2001, the whole market was about 1.2 trillion. Meanwhile, per day, dollars. Meanwhile, the market is seven and a half trillion. In the midst of all that, CLS doing a fine job settling a bunch of trades and what have you. But the bit that's not in CLS is now three times the value of what it was when we had no CLS. So I think back to 1999, there's some regulators doing you know, what we might term a huge song and a dance about the private sector should get its act together and sort this out for 1.2 trillion. And here we are 20 odd years later. We have three times the volume and we don't have any new infrastructure because that stuff can't go through CLS. But geez, that's a lot of money. You know, if that goes wrong and that some of that, if that goes wrong stuff played into uh, the events very close to where you and I are broadcasting from today down the road at Parada Plaza a few, only a few weeks ago in the, we, it, we, the Americans and the Brits expect the Swiss to get their act together and sort out Credit Suisse by Sunday night or else. And I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to say that Credit Suisse couldn't have settled its trades on Monday. And had that gone wrong, that would have sent reverberations from Washington all the way down to Auckland in New Zealand um, because we couldn't settle trades. And as I now look at all these events, whether it's Silicon Valley Bank with some of their problems, whether it's the UK pension fund industry, um, these things are, geez, the stress on liquidity now is... This is, a, this is a big deal. Our market infrastructure is, is, is no longer really fit for purpose. There you go. Stump okay. speech. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, with, you know, your, um, our discussion and your insights, I'm thinking about the tokenization, um, not experiments, uh, whatever has happened in the private markets, because we do have private uh, assets uh, like, um, you know, hedge funds or um, yep. you know, private uh, shares or or private equity funds that are tokenized. The other day I was reading even 
um, Franklin, Templeton, token yep, market fund, and, yep. and so on. So, and, and there's innovators, especially in Singapore, licensed by, by the Monetary Authority of Singapore that have done these things. But of course, these are, you know, really small dots, uh, you know, compared yeah. to uh, the size of private um, markets. And, and what I'm thinking from um, your reflections that it's impossible to scale something like this in the private sector and unless we get this clarity from the central bankers. As and the regulators, yes, well, whichever hat they happen to wear. Very much so. I think if you look at how does change happen in banks, you can broadly divide up the activities into two books. There's the mandatory and the discretionary. Mandatory is generally when there's a date. We do reasonably well as a collective of financial services firms when there's a date, whether it's the euro, the introduction of new margin regulations, um, even the introduction of CLS, eventually we had a date. And then everyone at first flaps around and go, ah, they're not really going to do it. They're not going to be on time. But in, in the end, we get there. And we tend to march well when there's a date. As soon as there isn't a date, there's discretion. And as soon as there's discretion, to the herding cats thing in the title at the, at the start of our chat, you've got to herd the cats to make the same discretionary decision in the same space of time to do the same thing, which is very, very difficult. So I think that back to the public private angle, and I described the, the ballpark, um, I think, yeah, on the infrastructure side, yeah, you need the central banks to get together and say, right, guys, buy. December 31st, you have to come up with a design that can be implemented by, for the sake of argument, December 31st, two years later, and start to put dates around it. So, and I think we have we have an unfortunate setting at the moment. So we've got this overly active public sector experimenting to their heart's delight, as it were, with you know, relatively unlimited budgets um, and no dates. And so it's very, very hard to get a collective of banks and get enough of a head of steam to introduce something that's practically discretionary um, that's in there. So that's that's where the, the difficulty comes of herding the cats to uh, to get things to, to move along. You did touch on tokenization. I think some of that stuff is great. I was actually talking uh, with some other folks just before this call about exactly the Franklin Templeton thing. Um, and I think there, the interesting part is an asset becomes both a store of value and potentially even a means of payment. So yeah. if you've tokenized a bond fund, like the Franklin Templeton one, and for sake of argument, you have a thousand units of that bond fund. If you were a client of, let's guess you're a client, like I am of UBS down the road or whatever, yeah. um, we probably can only buy or sell a hundred units of the fund and there's probably a settlement every month so you and i we make decisions investments cash but yeah separate we, we consumer can separate. banking from investments is yeah, separate. fine all, all good and maybe you know if we have a good year we'll buy another thousand units whatever but with the whole tokenization thing and fractionalization suddenly you go well that's great i i have a thousand units of this franklin templeton fund which is close to cash I'll take the risk that, you know, I might not be able to redeem it when I want to, but it's fine. I'll have the option, and traders do like optionality. I'll have the option of being in the market and getting my return. If I need to buy, I was in South Africa recently, and you know, if I've been at some uh, winery and wanted to send 24 bottles of some nice red wine or champagne back to Switzerland, I could have paid out of a wallet holding that. So it'd be my individual wallet my wallet separate from your wallet. They may both have been sponsored by UBS to do all the KYC, AML, good behavior stuff that we know and love so well. I could have connected that to a merchant in South Africa who said, well, actually, I don't want to be paid in Franklin Templeton things, but I'll, um, I'll take USDC for the sake of argument, um, a stable coin, or even conceivably could have taken JP Morgan coin. But, but that between my saying I'll, I'll i'll spend half a unit of my i've got a thousand units of the fund i'll spend half a unit of a fund to buy the wine 
that goes to a DeFi marketplace. There's an instant exchange of my half a unit fractionalized for USDC. Somebody's happy to make a market in that very special electronic thing. It all happens instantly. Merchant in South Africa is happy. I'm happy. My store of value is also a means of payment. I've kept optionality to play in the markets. Anyway. Wow, now I and, see where And all of the, the merchant might want to, to keep the, your uh, uh, Franklin tablet and uh, tokens. Yeah, it, it, absolutely I, free to, to do that. Assume other things being equal, of course, on the regulatory yeah, front. Yeah. I mean, I would think um, that in 2030, we might stop talking about the payments sector and the innovators in the payment sector and so on. And we will replace that term by talking about those that are in the value transfer business. Because, yes, that's, you know, yeah. it could be like that. Because if a lot of our, what we consider financial assets today, whatever they are, they're a fund, they're whatever they are, if they are liquid and fractionalized, as you described, then why not use them as a means of exchanging? You know, you want wine, you've got this, and and, and so on. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think, uh, as I said, people will get optionality. Now, uh, of course, you get into investor protection that people have to understand that, you know, investments go up and down and, yeah. uh, 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 and all the rest of it. And you have to be thoughtful. But I think we will do that in... In new ways, I think we will have those assets in individual wallets. So um, this whole possibility, and this is something else that we've had around the FTX collapse of exchanges sticking their hands in the cookie jar marked client assets. Um, they could have kept them separate. Just they could have followed. We have perfectly good rules for that, by the way. Well, I mean, the FTX yeah. case is just, a violation of governance of traditional businesses. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with, you know, new rails or anything like that. Yeah. Let, not, let's uh, yes, let's absolutely. not... Uh, uh, Bad practices. But yeah. then as we move to this idea of the whole Web3 wallet thing, that just gets so exciting. There's all the investor protection of your wallet separate from my wallet. Um, and, and even the good folks from UBS in days past used to borrow client securities um, without actually telling the clients. Credit Swiss did the same, by the way. Um, it's a, it's a well-known phenomenon. But suddenly now our assets very precisely in our Web3 wallets in a nice sponsored environment. We're not too worried about forgetting the keys or, or all that security stuff takes care of itself. We can spend them freely. Their store of value means a payment. You know, we, we might have a variety of things in that wallet. One could be tokenized cash, in which case it's great. It's redeemable at par. The other could be our Franklin Templeton mm -hmm. assets that we're like, yeah, fine. We'll invest in those. Generally, you know, over 10 years, we'll do fine doing that trade. Um, yeah. Even if one day we have to sell something at 99.5 instead of 100, um, we'll, we'll make those choices. So I think we're the composability of the new tech will bring us new services. But that, I think, will be a private sector uh, offering whether the private sector will work out which way to compose the assets and the pieces to to create new new flows, um, replacing some of the things uh, that we have. And somewhere in there will be CBDC of the wholesale, the retail kind, or its commercial equivalent. Um, there's also when you get to that CBDC stuff and everything that's going on, I have to say uh, we do need a benign monopoly. We don't need 27 stable coins. We don't need, you know, if Finality are going to do pounds on chain, redeemable at par, we don't need the Bank of England to do it. Um, yeah. Too much competition could be a, a dangerous thing. And a, you have to be careful how you say that. I'm a, I'm a plumbing guy. So it's like, yeah, can we just have one pot of pounds, please? <laughs> it makes life so much easier. <laughs> There's a limit well, to that note, Olaf, of, uh, you, you know, you, you highlighted the composability, which is a, a, a really core uh, capability of these new technologies. And, and I, I do believe it will be core in whatever our plumbing future is going to be. Wallets to whoever 
um, from the private sector helps in the adoption of the kind of wallets that that we discussed, distinguished from the Apple and the Google wallet, uh, but talking about real wallets where they're non-custodial, but providers provide access um, that is yep. suitable to, to, to fit the purpose of whatever's in, in the wallet. Um, before closing, I want to ask you about your banker's uh, plumber handbook and where people can yep. find you and uh, follow mm -hmm. you with your uh, experiences and insights. So thank you very much for the for the for the plug there. Um, so on LinkedIn, you can find me at the Bankers Plumber. That's easy enough. We'll put in uh, Olaf Ransom, the name you'll see on the screen. Both will find me easily. Um, and you'll see on the, the sign behind me the, the, the website where you can go buy the book on an EPUB download is 3cadvisory.com. Um, but it's uh, relatively easy to find if you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and then uh, if you do get lost, you can, once you connect, I can uh, I can point you in the right direction. So uh, so thanks for that. And very shortly, not not a commercial thing, but we'll have. We, I talked about some of the stuff around liquidity. Uh, there'll be a couple of publications coming out on some views on look, the infrastructure is broken and we need to fix it. Um, so I hope people will engage with that and uh, let me test whether my thinking is in the right direction or not. It's important these days to to share thinking and hear different uh, views because yes. uh, you know we we live in a, in a time where everything's been rethought, but at the same time there's so many things that are collapsing, breaking, not functioning. Um, you know we don't know who's responsible for what, uh, so it's it's a pretty confusing period. So it's important to share thoughts and, and exchange ideas and, and feedback. Uh, yep. all of it, it it really, thank you very Thanks much. Thank I'll you. see you soon and maybe we manage a coffee uh, out in the city. 100% at Paradeplatz, right? Ciao for now.